Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO and undoubted winner of capitalism. Like a lot of recently divorced middle-aged dudes, Bezos has been going through some stuff lately. But unlike normal dudes, Bezos can't deal with his midlife crisis by just buying a sports car or brewing craft beer. He's the world's richest man. So he's gotta do something that's out of this world. Amazon founder and the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, will soon add a new title, astronaut. His space company, Blue Origin, announced that this morning that Bezos and his brother Mark will fly to space on the company's first human flight. That's scheduled for July 20th. Another seat on the flight is being auctioned off this Saturday, bidding already underway and is currently more than $2.8 million. That's right, people. Jeff Bezos is shipping himself into space. And you know who this is great news for? Elon Musk. Because you realize for a few hours, he can be like, ha ha, I'm now the richest man on earth. Yes, the richest man. Ah, oh, he's back. I'm gonna go tweet about Bitcoin now. Now, if you ask me, I think space travel is a natural fit for the founder of Amazon. I mean, think about it. Astronauts are just workers who have to wear diapers because they don't get bathroom breaks. So, I mean, it makes total sense. My favorite part of the story, though, is that Jeff Bezos's ship is auctioning off another seat for this trip. Why? You're Jeff Bezos. Just pay the extra money to not sit with a stranger on a trip to space. I mean, this is the culmination of your childhood dream. You don't wanna spend it fighting over the armrest? And I know $2.8 million sounds like a lot of money for a trip to space, but keep in mind, that's basically how much it costs to change your flight on United. Actually, you know what would be amazing? We should all get together and we start a GoFundMe where we buy that second seat and we give it to Bernie Sanders. Man, that would be a trip. This flight could have paid for everyone's healthcare, but oh, you had to see the stars up close. And why is space so cold? Somebody turn up the damn thermostat. Let's move on now to the big political news out of the United States Senate, the political body most likely to need your help with resetting their microwave clocks. Red states around the country have been coming up with all sorts of inventive ways to restrict voting. They're cutting back on voting hours, making it harder to get mail-in ballots, and requiring that all polling locations in black neighborhoods need to be at the center of a corn maze. Makes sense. And because of all of that, Democrats have been trying to pass a new federal law that would guarantee certain voting rights nationwide. But as they just found out, sometimes it'd be your own people that take you down. It is Monday, June 7th, and if Democrats were hoping to pass a voting rights bill or end the legislative filibuster, Joe Manchin just tossed a giant monkey wrench into their plans. The Democratic senator from West Virginia announcing that he will not support either an enormous setback for his party and the president. Manchin defended his decision in an op-ed in the Charleston Gazette Mail, writing voting and election reform that is done in a partisan manner will all but ensure partisan divisions continue to deepen. I think it's the wrong piece of legislation to bring our country together and unite our country. And I'm not supporting that because I think it would divide us further. I don't want to be in a country that's divided any further than I'm in right now. I love my country. And I think my Democrat and Republican colleagues feel the same. Ah, Joe Manchin. I feel you, man. I feel you. But you do realize you and the Republicans are not playing the same game. Like, you think you're solving a jigsaw puzzle together, but those guys are here for a boxing match. And I mean real boxing not whatever Logan Paul and Floyd Mayweather were doing last night. I mean, whatever you think of Joe Manchin's bipartisan fetish, you have to acknowledge he's a terrible negotiator. Because think of it, the only way Joe Manchin can get what he wants is if Republicans are worried that he might end the filibuster. But if he starts by saying that he won't do that, well, then Republicans have no reason to negotiate with him. It's like if a kidnapper called the family and was like, now before we discuss the ransom, you should know that your daughter escaped a couple of days ago. I would still like a million dollars, though. Hello? I will say, though, one thing Joe Manchin is very good at is making himself the most important person in the room. Because in a 50-50 Senate, you can become powerful just by saying that you might not agree with what everyone else in your party wants. Like, a Democrat could just say, I'm not sure if we should raise taxes on the rich, and everyone pays attention to them. Or a Republican could say, I'm not sure we should hang Mike Pence. <sighs> and finally, let's make like baby girl Lisa and go to Nigeria, where a fight is brewing over Twitter. Everyone loves to complain about Twitter. 
And some people get so sick of it that they quit completely, you know, and then they come back six weeks later to explain why they couldn't actually quit completely. But that's for ordinary people. If you are the most powerful person in your country, it turns out if you get mad at Twitter, you can make everyone quit. Nigeria is a country plagued by kidnappings, extremists, and bandits, but the government wants to crack down on a new type of criminal, Twitter users. It banned the social media platform after Twitter deleted a post by the president. Nigerians are reacting with shock and frustration after the government suspended Twitter's operations in the country on Friday. The move comes just about two days after the social media platform deleted a tweet by Nigerian President Muhammad Buhari that some say threatened to punish regional separatists. Twitter says the tweet violated its abusive behavior policy. This morning, I couldn't even tweet. You see, it's, 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 it's shameful. Damn, I can't believe it. Nigeria banned Twitter. This is outrageous, undemocratic, and indefensible. Also, I will be moving to Nigeria because that sounds like paradise. But yes, thanks to their vindictive president, Nigerians are gonna have a much harder time complaining about the government on Twitter. And on top of that, it's gonna be a lot harder to spoil mayor of East Town. I mean, they're gonna have to go door to door now. So can you understand? The whole time, it was more about the social dynamics of a small town than about the mother itself. The mother wasn't really important, huh? No, Damita Devayo, why would you do that to me, oh, huh? I'm only on episode two. How can you spoil that for me? But hey, man, shout out to African presidents because they will always remind the world what a real dictator looks like. Because remember when, when Twitter started flagging Trump's tweets, all he did was throw a tantrum. You know he's gotta be jealous as hell right now. It's like I've always said, those shithole countries, they know what they're doing. I worry, that you. And just by the way, this is, this is random, but did you catch how the CNN anchor introduced this story? If you didn't, I'm gonna play it again for you. Nigeria is a country plagued by kidnappings, extremists, and bandits, but the government wants to crack down on a new type of criminal, Twitter users. Okay, as an African, allow me to say, what the f I mean, yes, that's all true, but still, what the f Right, you never hear a foreign news anchor talking about the United States that way. America is a country plagued by school shootings, extremists, and failing infrastructure. But the government wants to raise the price of postage stamps. Bitcoin, the only thing that's more volatile than the president's dog. After reaching an all-time high just a couple of months ago, the world's most popular cryptocurrency has been cratering lately, thanks to an endless onslaught of bad news. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are under pressure amid concerns that China may escalate again its crackdown on the industry. Your morning crypto check, Bitcoin has been all over the place. It had a rough day, certainly over the weekend. It fell after Chinese social media platform Weibo suspended several crypto-related pages. Bitcoin giving up most of today's gains after the U.S. Treasury calls for a crackdown on crypto accounting. The department says it will require transfers of $10,000 or more to be reported to the IRS and describes crypto as a, quote, significant detection problem when it comes to taxes. Check out the cryptocurrency sliding over a tweet from Elon Musk. The Tesla CEO tweeting hashtag Bitcoin with a broken heart emoji and a picture of a couple talking about a breakup. Ah, oh, shame, man. You know, I don't care if you're a person or a currency. Nobody wants to get dumped in public by a tweet. The only way to get dumped that's more embarrassing than that is if someone objects at your wedding and it actually works. Oh, shit, is that Brad? Oh, man, I didn't know Brad was single. Come on up here, baby. Get out of here, get out of here. I didn't know he was around. Come up here, baby. Now, it's bad enough for Bitcoin that it's number one fanboy is off the bandwagon, but the real threat to Bitcoin is increased crackdowns from the likes of China and the IRS. And it turns out that they're not the only ones calling for more regulation. Former President Trump pouring cold water on the Bitcoin crowd, dissing the original cryptocurrency. The currency of this world should be the dollar. And I don't think we should have all of uh, the Bitcoins of the world out there. Bitcoin, it just seems like a scam. I think they should regulate them very, very high. 
regulate them very, very high. <laughs> Never before has a person born and raised in America talked so much like a European guy who's trying to blend in. I think they should regulate them. How you say, very, very high, yes? Now, to be honest with you, I would have thought Trump would be a huge fan of Bitcoin. I mean, it's a way to both hide dirty money and destroy the environment at the same time. What's not to like? But keep in mind, just because Trump calls it a scam doesn't mean that he's against it. It just means he's probably working on his own version. Like I say, there's a 99% chance that by the end of the year, he's gonna introduce the Trump coin. It might look like a Chuck E. Cheese token and you can only use it at Chuck E. Cheese, but that's called the blockchain. Now, lots of people have wanted to regulate Bitcoin for a long time, but what has always made that so difficult is that it's untraceable. I mean, that's why it's the preferred payment method of drug lords, international hackers, and people who subscribe to my OnlyFans. It's where I wear my skimpiest hoodies. But now, people who assumed that nobody could see what they were doing with Bitcoin might be having some second thoughts. The Justice Department has managed to seize a big portion of the money that Colonial Pipeline paid to Russian hackers. On Monday, the Justice Department said it seized 63.7 bitcoins, which is the equivalent of $2.3 million, more than half the ransom payment. Cryptocurrency is favored by cyber criminals because it allows for direct online payments regardless of location. But in this case, FBI agents obtained the private key or password for the cyber criminal's cryptocurrency wallet. Bitcoin was designed to be, let's, you know, to put it, to put it e easily, it's, it's, it's untraceable. It's designed to be untraceable. This is a first, as far as I know. The DOJ recovered 85% of the Bitcoins paid in the ransom, but since then, Bitcoin has lost a considerable amount of value. So what Colonial Pipeline got back is worth $2.3 million or $2 million less than what they originally paid. Damn! The FBI managed to track this ransom down and take it back. This is a huge blow for Bitcoin's reputation. I mean, Bitcoin without untraceability is like Superman without any powers. Now you're just some creep with these underwear on the outside. I don't want you catching me falling from anywhere. And if you're a hacker, now what do you do? I mean, if Bitcoin is not safe, I mean, maybe instead of using high-tech money, they need to go the complete opposite direction. Demand all their payments in seashells. And not those broken seashells either. I want the big smooth ones where you can hear the ocean, so I can always remember this magical day. So, Bitcoin is facing a lot of headwinds right now, from increased regulation to the FBI tracking it around the internet like it's a black guy in a department store. And hopefully you didn't buy Bitcoin at its peak in April, because as of today, it's down almost 50%. But it doesn't seem like true believers of Bitcoin are going anywhere anytime soon. This morning, the surging popularity of cryptocurrencies on full display. Bitcoin 2021, considered the largest crypto conference in history. Honestly, it's exhilarating. I feel like it's fresh, it's new. It's so interesting to see people come from all over the world. A sold out event with some 12,000 ticket holders. It's the most exciting event in the world right now. Flocking to see headliners from Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey to boxer Floyd Mayweather. Speakers, investors, and scholars talked about the crypto's rapid growth and its future. Elon Musk was in the crosshairs of the Bitcoin faithful. Wow, okay. I don't know what's up with that guy, but I do know you can't roll up Bitcoin and snort anything with it, so we can rule that out. But honestly, after seeing that, I'm back on board, man. Because yeah, Bitcoin is incredibly volatile and unpredictable, and now the FBI is tracking it. But on the other hand, it does seem fun as hell. I mean, you get to go to huge conventions in Miami with thousands of people, and you get to hang out with crypto Willy Wonka. I mean, you don't get that kind of energy from fans of the dollar or the euro, and you definitely don't get it at the seashell convention. All right, everybody, what we're gonna do now is put our money up to our ear and listen to the sound of the ocean. Ah, ah, my money has a crab in it! Ah, somebody help me! Insects, they're like aliens that you can kill with a shoe. 
It has been about a month since the brood 10 cicada swarm emerged in the eastern United States, and it turns out their charm is quickly wearing off. A cicada is being blamed for causing an Ohio car accident. Cincinnati police say that one of the insects flew through an open car window Monday, hitting the driver in the face. The car drove off the road and then crashed into a utility pole. Cicadas grounding the White House press corps flight as they attempted to fly to Europe for President Biden's first foreign trip. The pesky insects apparently to blame for mechanical issues on the plane. Before boarding Air Force One, the president had to swat away a pretty big cicada that landed Landed on his neck. Watch out for the cicadas. I just got one. You got me. Oh shit! A cicada got Joe Biden? Yo, man, I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty sure that that means Joe Biden is now going to turn into a cicada. My fellow Americans, the State of the Union is. And for people living in areas where these cicadas have taken over, they're basically ruining your life. I mean, you walk out your door. They're all over your lawn. You drive to work, they're running your car off the road. You stumble home and they're in bed with your spouse. Oh, come on, honey, a cicada? He's 17! Moving on now to some personal finance news. If you hate paying taxes, well, first of all, congratulations on being basic. And also, congratulations on being a billionaire. A bombshell report by ProPublica reveals just how little the wealthiest Americans have been paying in taxes. ProPublica obtained more than 15 years of never-before-seen IRS information about the 25 richest Americans and found that sometimes they paid little or no federal income taxes. In 2018, for example, ProPublica found Elon Musk paid no federal income tax. Neither did Jeff Bezos in 2007 or 2011, the same year he claimed a $4,000 child tax credit. And renowned investor Warren Buffett avoided the most tax of any of the billionaires ProPublica looked at, according to the report. As shocking as it is, nothing that they did is illegal. Everything that they did is in keeping with our tax code. And the basic reason is we tax income, not wealth. Rich people often grow their fortunes through stocks, real estate, or companies, so they don't have to pay taxes until they sell. And they can offset their income in other ways, too, meaning it's legal to be worth a lot and pay a little. Ooh-wee! It's good to be a billionaire. I mean, imagine being so rich that you can afford accountants who make you look poor. Think about it, Jeff Bezos is so good at hiding his wealth that he qualified for a child tax credit. This dude built his own rocket to take him to space. And the US government is like, hey brother, here's something for the kids until you can get back on your feet. Hard times, Jeff. And yeah, this is something that everyone already suspected, but it's still shocking to see proof right in front of you. It's the difference between knowing how hot dogs are made and watching them put the puppies in the machines. Yo, that's crazy. Well, then what was I eating? And the thing is, much like wearing cargo shorts to the Pride Parade, these tax loopholes are both messed up and completely legal. So if you wanna change the system, then you need to take action and write to your congressperson. Then, your congressperson can hold your letter in one hand and the campaign check from the billionaire in the other hand and decide which one they want to wipe their ass with. And finally, it's almost the end of the school year in most of America. Seniors are trying on their caps and gowns, getting formal face masks for their socially distanced proms and forming new lifelong relationships with their student loans. But some Florida students who are expecting to get their senior yearbooks this week will have to wait just a little longer. A South Florida high school now facing questions today after it stopped selling yearbooks with pages dedicated to the Black Lives Matter movement. Students at the West Broward High School added a two-page feature on how the school responded to the movement. But after some parents complained, the school stopped selling it. Teachers and parents reportedly complained that there were not any opposing views. Those that complained said that the yearbook should have mentioned something more like Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter. Hmm. People, people, calm down. It's silly to get this angry over two pages in a book that you're just gonna throw in the attic for 40 years and then only whip out to prove to your granddaughter you were once hot. And as far as I know, your books don't usually have opposing views. There's no least likely to succeed. 
You don't see a page that says, congratulations, Poetry Club, on a great year. And then the next page that says, eat shit, Poetry Club, express yourself in a narrative form or get the f- out of here. Oh, and by the way, isn't it amazing how people always tell on themselves? Because the opposing view to Black Lives Matter is not blue lives matter or all lives matter. It's black lives don't matter. Yeah. And if you want to see that opinion represented, you don't need a yearbook. Just look at a history book. Joe Biden, president of the United States and man who signs every text message like it's an email, arrived in Europe yesterday for his first foreign trip as president and his first trip to England since the ribbon cutting ceremony at Stonehenge. And it looks like he's already making headlines. This morning, President Biden is in England, where he's set to meet with Prime Minister Boris Johnson before the start of the G7 summit. Mr. Biden is also expected to announce a historic COVID vaccine donation to low-income nations. 200 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine this year, 300 million by the first half of next year, all going to 92 countries who need it the most. One of the key sort of highlights of their visit together will be this re-signing, this re-affirmation, as it were, of the Atlantic Charter a new Atlantic Charter modeled after that post-war declaration from 1941 between FDR and Winston Churchill, uh, focusing on the cooperation between the two nations. It'll highlight things like defense and trade, climate change, and a shared effort to combat cyber threats as well. That's right, people. Joe Biden and Boris Johnson are updating the Atlantic Charter that was first signed back in 1941. And both sides got some concessions, right? The UK agreed to limit the number of royal refugees that they'll send to the US. And in exchange, the US agreed to start putting the letter U back into words again. Plus, the UK will produce more Harry Styleses and the US will start calling soccer football and football brain ouchie time. Everybody wins. But that is also a huge announcement that Biden made over there. The United States is donating 500 million vaccines to the rest of the world, which seems generous until you remember that Biden can't get anyone else in America to take them, right? So it's kind of like giving your friend that old exercise bike that you've just been hanging your clothes on. And let me be the first to say, on behalf of the international community, thank you to all the anti-vaxxers in America. The people of the world would not have these vaccines if it wasn't for your commitment to believing whatever the dumbest guy from your middle school posted on Facebook. You guys are the real heroes. Moving on now to some breaking science news. We're all familiar with the oceans of the world, right? Atlantic, Pacific, uh, posh and sporty. Well, as of today, there's a new ocean in town. It may well be time to toss out all of your old world maps because There's a big change to tell you about. National Geographic announced this week it would now officially recognize a fifth ocean called the Southern Ocean. Geographers say the swift current circling Antarctica keeps the waters distinct and worthy of their own name. National Geographic says its map policy committee has actually been considering this change for several years. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. You guys just found a new ocean on a planet that's been around for, I don't know, like 800 years? Was it hiding behind an iceberg or something? I just like, I don't get how we didn't realize this sooner. It's like, it's like discovering that your apartment has a second kitchen under the sofa. Huh, oh, I guess I just never looked under here before. And by the way, I love how this whole thing is just a statement by National Geographic. Because you realize they're not part of the UN or anything, right? They're just a magazine but they're the magazine about nature, so we all go with it. Oh, National Geographic says it, yes, yes. It's almost like if Playboy announced that there's a third boob, we'll all be like, well, I haven't seen it, but if Playboy says it, it's gonna be true. But I have to ask, have humans learned nothing from colonization? We shouldn't go around drawing borders around the places we don't live, right? That should be up to the fishes who live there. And that's why I went under the sea to ask them about it in person. Hello, my fish friends. Where would you like us to draw your borders? What? No, why don't you go back to where you came from? You racist ass fish. Go say that to me, I'm trying to be your friend. I'll see you at sushi. I don't even know where fish learned the N word. In other science news, 
Let's talk about death. It's when you get canceled by nature. But if you've been looking for a loophole, a new discovery might just give you some hope. Well, listen to this story. Scientists say a tiny worm has come back to life after being frozen underground for 24,000 years. I'm not sure how they know that, but they say the microscopic organism you see here, even though it's not thrilling, well, Russian scientists say they found it in the permafrost lands of northeastern Siberia and transported it to a Russian lab to examine its biology and history. Scientists say the worm has by far the longest recorded survival period in a frozen state. Wow. A worm coming back to life after 24,000 years. What a miracle of science and nature and life. I'll give you five bucks if you eat that thing. And you know, we always think about things from our perspective as humans, but can you imagine what it was like for that worm? I mean, that worm was probably surprised to see human scientists around him because 24,000 years ago, we were all just cavemen. That's how much things can change in 24,000 years. In fact, all those people who go into cryogenic storage now they might wake up in 24,000 years and find out that the worms are now in charge. Well, well, well. If it isn't the guy who dissected my ancestor in seventh grade biology, how the tables have turned. Also, uh, no disrespect to worms, but it's probably easier to survive getting frozen when you're a worm. I mean, worms don't have a whole lot going on. You know, they're pretty much just a mouth and a butt. That's it. Pretty sure God was running out of ideas for animals. Then he saw that cardboard thing in the middle of a paper towel roll and he was like, okay, that's a living thing now. And finally, some big media news today. CNN analyst Jeffrey Tubin returned to the air for the first time in eight months and had to have a pretty painful conversation about why he hasn't been on TV. I feel like we should address um, what's happened in the months since we've seen you. So uh, I guess I'll recap. I'll do the honors. <laughs> Help yourself. Okay. <laughs> um, in October, you were on a Zoom call with your colleagues from the New Yorker magazine. Everyone took a break for several minutes, during which time you were caught masturbating on camera. Uh, you were subsequently fired from that job after 27 years of working there. Do I have all that right? Um, you got it all right, sad to say. I think one point, I, I wouldn't exactly say in my defense because nothing is really in my defense. I didn't think I was on the call. I didn't think other people could see me. Now, that's not a defense. This was deeply moronic and indefensible, but I mean, that, that, is, part of, that, that is part of the story. Um, and, you know, I have spent the seven subsequent months, miserable months in my life, I can certainly confess, um, trying to be a better person. I mean, in therapy, trying to do some public service, um, working in a food bank, which I certainly am going to continue to do. But I am trying to become the kind of person that people can trust again. Uh, you, I can't watch. Oh man, I cannot think of anything more awkward to watch than that interview. Okay, maybe one other thing. And you know, I bet the awkwardness lasted after that interview too, because you know that Jeffrey Tubin doesn't trust cameras anymore, right? And cut. All right, Jeffrey, we're clear. So the camera is off. Yep. I'm just gonna smash that camera with a hammer if you don't mind. You know, I don't know if you picked this up, but one thing I don't get is when he says he's been working in a food kitchen. Like, I mean, that's great, don't get me wrong, but I don't really see the connection with what he did. You know, if anything, that's just unfair to the people at the food kitchen. Hello, would you like a piece of fruit? Uh, no, thank you. I think I'll go a couple more days without eating. Before we go, please consider supporting an organization called the Brave Space Alliance. They're a black-led, trans-led LGBTQ plus center on the south side of Chicago, and your donation helps them provide life-saving resources like support groups, HIV prevention options, and housing and food services for the entire LGBTQ plus community of Chicago. If you are able to help in any way, go to the link below and donate what you can.